Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. The Red Angus breed continues to grow in numbers and influence. Why? It's because of the quality cattle and the hardworking folks who produce them. Red Angus females are known as the beef industry's most favored female and have dominated the market for more than a decade. According to Superior Livestock data, Red Angus heifers command a $92 premium per head compared to all other breeds. The longevity, efficiency, and calm disposition of Red Angus females make them the ideal cow for today's producer. To explore opportunities through the Red Angus breed, visit redangus.org. Hey, hey, folks, it is Shay here, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are visiting with Elaine Frace and Lindsay Seafoot, and we are diving into the nitty gritty of farm compensation. So whether you are the senior generation or the rising generation, there are tips and strategies in here for you to better understand what compensation looks like, how you can get started with compensation, and why it is so important. So with that, before we dive into the episode, I do want to remind you to head to my website and sign up for my newsletter, because with that, you will get free tips and resources sent to your inbox every Monday. It's pretty short and sweet, and uh, I really try to pack as much value into a weekly newsletter as I can without overloading your inbox. But with that, let's visit with Elaine and Lindsay. <clears throat> well, all right, ladies, I am excited to have both of you on here. Uh, Lindsay, I know it was kind of a last minute deal for you to jump on, but I'm glad to have you on here too. For those folks that are out here listening today, we are going to be talking about the importance of compensation um, in farm and ranches, on farms and ranches, specifically family farms and ranches. And so with me, I have Elaine Frace. And those of you who are loyal listeners, you've heard Elaine before. And new to the show, we have Lindsay Seafoot. So gals, thank you for joining me. And before we kind of dive into that, I'll have each of you introduce yourself briefly so that the audience has a better idea of who you are, where you're located and what you do. So Elaine, let's start with you. You are a very much a well-known face and figure in the family transition space, and you've been on the show before, but can you just briefly reintroduce yourself to those maybe new listeners on the show? Yes, and for all the cattle ranchers listening to this, if you don't know me, I just need you to know I used to chase cows and have a barbed wire scar on my left leg to prove it. So I grew up on a cattle farm. I'm married to a certified seed grower. We live on mile 16 north of the U.S. border in southwestern Manitoba at Boisevain. And I'm a farm family coach, and you can find me at farmfamilycoach.com. But my desire for all the listeners is to know you're not alone on this journey. It's a journey and uh, we have lots of things and tools we'd like to share with you because that's what we do as farm family coaches. So glad to be back, Shay. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So Lindsay, can you mm -hmm. introduce, introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners? Sure. Thanks for having me, first of all. And um, so a little bit like Elaine, I grew up on a farm. I wasn't chasing cattle. I was chasing pigs. My dad had a hog farm. Um, and we, uh, now I live in Wawanisa, um, and we serve a sort of Southwestern Manitoba as well. And I do HR consulting primarily, uh, my, per my personal focus is in the ag world. So we work with agribusiness and with farms to help support the HR function. And that includes, of course, things like compensation policy, um, anything to do with employees and how to, ha how to get them, how to work well with them and how to be a good leader. Well, thank you. So diving right in to the conversation and not wasting any time here. I mean, the big overarching question I have is why is compensation so important on family farms, whether people view themselves as a smaller family farm or farm, or if they're a larger operation that has some sort of business structure settled out, why is compensation so critical to family farms and ranches? Well, how many people have you known are fighting about money lately? <laughs> That's kind of the root of it, isn't it? Is that when we talk about compensation, Shay, I have actually two comments on this. And so we'll deal with the compensation or salary that the farmers and ranchers are getting right now, currently, day to day, whether that's as a salary, a monthly salary, or an hourly wage. 
Uh, because the other part of compensation that hits my world in farm transition is delayed compensation, which other people will call sweat equity. But why either the, the current daily compensation or what monthly, however that works out, or whether it's delayed, it's really important because you need money to make money. Also, you need money to buy diapers. And I have stories about this, about young farmers who were crying at the grocery till, wondering about whether or not they'd have enough money in the family account to actually live. And what I find in the cattle industry that really irritates me is that people are working for a lot of promises into the future. And as Jolene, my friend in, in Iowa says, a conversation is not a contract. And that's where Lindsay will come in with her HR specialty. So the reason we're talking about compensation today is there's two kinds of compensation on the farm, the hidden perks and the ones that actually go into your bank account as a paycheck on payroll. And so I, I want people listening to this to know you need enough to live. And I think you and I have talked, Shay, about what does it cost a ranch family to live? And if you're listening to this in downtown South Dakota, you need $84,000 a year for your spouse and your two kids to live on a ranch. And that's a very moderate income. And, and that's based on the, on the work of Farm Credit America. And they have a lovely... Um, tool webinar called Two Economists and a Lender that listeners can also seek out. But it's the whole story about having to live first. Well, great. But then also on your ranch, you need to buy cattle. You need to buy feed. You need to buy, um, you know, stock gates, whatever, whatever it is you need to cash flow. How are you going to cash flow that if you don't have disposable income, i.e. extra money beyond living to actually buy equity into your business? So, that would be my framing first. Okay. Lindsay, do you have anything to add on to that from your HR perspective on why comp compensation is so critical to farm and ranch families? Yeah, I think this question of compensation being so critical, I, I mean, Elaine made all the exceptionally good points there. Um, the only thing I think that I would maybe add from the HR perspective is that um, it, compensation, whether it's on a family farm or in a huge corporation, compensation should be treated um, in a fair and structured way that pays people for what they're worth and what they are contributing. Um, and I think a lot of times in the family farm, we kind of ignore these structures. And um, and then I think the lack of structure causes uh, areas of vulnerability and question and then potentially causes disagreements. So at the core, I think... Um, it should be treated with the same sort of way we would approach salaries in any other situation. And that will avoid a big ripple effect of possible issues in the future. And Those I, are... think, I think say just one other thing that Lindsay said that, that's really important based on skill, that compensation should also be merit based, not just because you're the oldest son or the oldest daughter, or because you have a brother. And I have situations in my farm family coaching practice where I have two brothers one who's a manager and doing all the decision making and all the heavy lifting in terms of planning and management. The other one is really a farm laborer. And I think Lindsay can tell you those are two different skill sets and two different compensation models. But in this case, there's a lot of conflict because they're both paying, being paid exactly the same. Very common, very common issue too, for sure in a family farm, especially. So what, you know, before there's a lot we could dive into just off of what you both said, but I think, you know, as you talk about structure and fairness, before we dive into that, what can compensation look like? I mean, we've talked, you've talked about salary, you've talked about hour, hourly, you've talked about delayed, you've talked about hidden perks. I know right away when I came back to my family's farm after college, one of my hidden perks was I could just go to the freezer and grab beef. But <laughs> so, you know, what what can compensation look like for family farms and ranches, just so people have an idea? So I'll just jump off the perks part. I have Dick Whitman's tool, who I respect dearly. He's from Idaho. His consulting firm is called Whitman, W-I-T-T-M-A-N, consulting.com. And if anyone listening to this podcast would like his compensation worksheets, just reach out to me at farmfamilycoach.com and say, send me the compensation worksheets and I'd be happy to. But that's only the piche around the hidden perks or the perks. 
And recently I had someone on my membership site do this and they said, oh, Elaine, this was very helpful because what they discovered is that there can be $14,000 or $20,000 worth of non-taxable benefits like beef, like what you mentioned, pulling beef from the freezer or getting half the cow, where they park their horse, their internet, their um, electricity, possibly also on ranch is quite common. The ranch owns the house, so you're not paying rent for the house. All of those things are worth value. So I'll let Lindsay uh, talk to the rest of it as well. Yeah, I would just add on that, that I think we see um, when when I work with farms, of course, and then I work with other types of business. So I think the perks and the hidden perks inside the family farm are just a lot more than in a traditional family business because they have more leeway for that kind of thing. Um, so like you said, the house, there's often vehicles, there's fuel and cell phones and all kinds of regular everyday bills that get built into that. And when we make compensation models for other people, we list out what's called total compensation. And we start with, what are you actually paid? And then there's about 15 bullet points under that of things we get that are worth financial value, but that maybe aren't, you know, dollars per hour. So that's where you have that big list of, of phones and other random things like you mentioned, beef or whatever those are. Um, and I would just draw an important distinction there that we're not talking about gifts that we give out of the goodness of our heart. We're talking about what comes if I'm signing an employment contract on your ranch, what is my deal financially and additional perks? Okay, so say right now there are family farms out there who, you know, either they're partners in the business or Maybe they are separate, but together, if that makes sense, they own their own land, but maybe share equipment with their parents. However, it may work. There's um, a lot of different ways people are operating right now, but they're not paying themselves. It's all one big checkbook. They might be paying the hired man, but not themselves or um, maybe spouses or whatever it may be. If you're part of the family, you don't get compensated. How can those conversation start? What are some steps to make that first change so that compensation does start happening? So the first thing I would say is let's do your own personal net worth statement first, whether you're listening to this as a 35-year-old rancher or you're the 65-year-old dad who's just stopped taking wage. I actually have a situation right now, Shay, where the farming dad is not taking any wage at all, which is horrible because he doesn't have a pension that he's built out. He hasn't been wise about building his personal wealth bubble to have some liquidity for other off farm or off ranch income. So let's, let's talk about the situation that you're not being paid at all, which is not wise for a 35 year old rancher, because my, my call to action on what you just said is get thee to a loans officer tomorrow, because when you get in front of somebody who can lend you money to, buy into equity on your ranch, whether that's cows or bins or haying equipment or whatever it is, you're going to find out pretty quickly, number one, you don't have a credit rating because you've never borrowed anything. And number two, you have no capacity to service debt. And I'm a really, I mean, I've done farm debt mediation for the federal government in Canada for 10 years, and I've seen what happens to people who don't have good financial literacy and don't understand how good debt works. And so compensation is also tied to your ability to leverage money. And if you're not being compensated well or fairly, you're also going to be angry. And if you're angry, there's going to be a lot of conflict on your ranch. And if there's conflict on your ranch, that's not good conflict that creates solutions. Then you're also going to have a whole pile of distracted management. So it's actually costing your ranch money not to have good compensation because not everybody's happy. And if everybody's not happy, then you have to figure out why. And if people have different skill sets, they need to have to be compensated for the skill set that they have. And if you're the aging rancher, say, oh, I don't need the money, Elaine, I'm fine. Well, actually you're really not because you don't have contingency plans to manage risk for how your age and your health is going to change. I mean, your age is going to change for sure. That's not going to ever I mean, we're all going to get older, right? That's a for sure. But whether or not you're going to need extra money or cash flow to manage your life uh, condition or circumstances, if you become disabled or if you become having to retrofit your ranch house or if, you know, the, and God forbid, this is what people think, oh, I, I'm never going to a care home. Well, you actually, you know, 15% of you listening to this will probably actually end up needing extended care. So it's not wise 
to not pay yourself well. And I'll let Lindsay take over the rest. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. The I have comments that echo what you're saying. I was kind of smiling. I, I'm also dealing with a, two or three situations right now where I have farm families who don't pay themselves anything. And in these situations, we're having conflict because different partners have different lifestyles. One has four kids, one has none. And now we've got this discrepancy over how much spending one does versus the other, but no one's actually taking organized income. So it's just, like you said, the resources and the management and the and the disagreements and the fighting and the not communication all just sort of balls up to, um, to be a really expensive problem for people who are trying not to spend the money, right? And then the same part um, of the no pension. I've heard this a lot of times where we don't pay ourselves, we don't pay pension, but we plan to, our kids will inherit the farm and we'll keep taking an income. Like, is that fair to pass on a business that has that kind of expense built in to your children? Um, so these are conversations that I'm sure, Elaine, you're facilitating. But when I talk to family farms about compensation, these are the kinds of questions you ask. If you were paying yourselves wages, like we said in the beginning, based off of scale and contribution, um, and everyone had a fair pay, spend your money how you please. But we kind of get in each other's business when we look at what each other's spending money on, and we're yes. sharing these accounts. Um, how could you not have conflict when you're looking at at people's spending habits? and and that extends to to the spouse of the son who's involved in the farm. And it just goes on and it causes so much conflict. So I don't know how far off base we are uh, with your question, Shay, but um, just to kind of bring it back to to the root there, I, I don't I don't really see any situation in which people don't pay themselves a structured wage that can end in a positivity. And the other thing I, that you two mentioned also, Lindsay and Shay, a lot of farms and ranches are incorporated. And so they can have shareholder loans. So you can draw out your dividend or whatever, however you want to draw out the money. And if you don't want to use it for family living or debt, personal debt or whatever, you can just keep it in the corp as a shareholder loan. And then it accrues you, but at least it's your, it's your property and it's your energy because money is really just a form of energy and it's a currency. But the other currency that we're not talking about in relationship to compensation is time. And if you ask a young rancher, would you rather like an increase in salary? Or would you like more time with your family? You might be surprised at the answer because time is the currency that people long for. And then, and then the other thing is, is how you track things. So another phrase I like to use is called clean accounting. So for instance, on our farm, which is a grain farm, our son gets to use our lovely expensive seeding and harvesting equipment, but he doesn't own it. My husband and I own it on our farm because we're in a joint venture. We have two corps that are joined together in a joint venture. But our accountant will, will let us know every year, this is the value of the um, money, labor, and expense of the equipment that you put into your son's planting. And it's like $25,000. And I think last year, some of the inputs were like $100,000. And so we actually, in effect, are giving him $100,000 worth of opportunity and not charging him for it. And we don't expect him to because we can absorb that cost. But it's nice that it be documented. So maybe, Lindsay, you want to talk about how people track mm -hmm. this clean accounting from a human resource perspective, because that also causes conflict when people say, I'm actually feeling quite used at the moment. Yeah, and that's super common, right, that people... Um they farm with their parents or their siblings and one person owns something and we rent it to each other. And it's, a, it's a, yeah, whether we track it or not. Um, the tracking part, when it comes to, when it comes to what people pay themselves, I mean, I've heard lots of shareholder loans, all of those sort of parts you mentioned. Um, I, I think at the end of the day that the tracking thing, when it comes to clean accounting, it just, I sort of think it makes everybody sleep better. If your corp pays you and you collect a T4 and you go on your way with your money, um, just like you would if you walked into another business and asked for a job. And in my personal opinion, there are going to be other ways that people track money and and um, the benefits and perks they get from boring machinery, et cetera. But I do think that there should be a chunk of money set aside that is taxed income that goes um, goes through the corp in a normal pay structure. That's my opinion. 
hey folks, if you want to start your own podcast, I will be the first to support you. Podcasts are an amazing method of building up your personal brand, increasing sales for your business, and applying your passion, all while sharing conversations and ideas that matter. With millions of podcasts that are out there today, I want yours to belong to the 50% that are successful, and more importantly, I want you to enjoy what you do. Check my show notes for a link to my website with free resources and different opportunities to help you get started on the right foot. So one thing that you've both brought up a couple times is paying people for their skill set and where they're at. So how do families determine, I mean, you can you can do a lot of self-assessment and figure out your own skill set or do skill sets with your family members, but how do you determine what that's worth and how much you should be, I want to say should be paying them, but can afford to actually be paying them? Cause that's going to be different too. Cause sometimes we maybe think we're worth more than what can the business maybe can afford to pay us too. So how can farmers and ranchers go about making those determinations for which people should get paid how much or Mm -hmm. what their worth is? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that um, the first place to start, so when we do compensation projects like this that are this exact question, sure, great, but how much is this position worth? We start by making us just a standard job description. And of course, people like myself, we do this all the time. So if anybody needs support on these kinds of things, you can reach out to us. I'm sure our contact info will be at the end here. Um, But we make a we make a job description and we sort of focus on how much of this is management duties. How big are these decisions that you're making? And if we're talking about big financial decisions and what someone's at the helm of the farm, we know that in this sort of structure that can look like a ladder if we want it to these positions at the top of it are worth more because of the responsibility. Um, And then I work sort of down from there. And I know it's not as easy as people sitting down at home by themselves and writing these things out. So a lot of times I do suggest people get support on this because money is a sensitive subject. And we come to the table, just like we all think our house is worth way more than it is because it's our beautiful home. We can sometimes have that with ourselves, right? I'm worth so much because of whatever. We feel this way sometimes about our contribution versus someone else's. So I think it can really be helpful to get outside support. But I would say there are a lot of wage scale things you can find out there. There's a lot of, if you're on your own with this, you can Google things about wage scale and where things fit. You'll know pretty quickly um, if you ask around to some farming friends even, because these, these um, no different than we lose employees to other, other wage scales. Someone's paying five bucks more. If you're paying five bucks less, you have to be aware that you're low on the scale. And so asking around is okay. And I think doing a little bit of research is okay. But also, again, like you said, your farm, it might be a $30 an hour position and your farm can afford $20 an hour. Well, then we start talking about what are those perks that come with it that aren't exactly dollar for dollar. So it's not an easy uh, answer because I think it takes, it does take some support and it can help to have, um, people who are experienced in this, but I would say the starting place is get on, get on your research and figure out what kind of pay scales exist that you can compare to. And the other point too, about it being delayed compensation, Shay. So let's say a rancher has come back from ag college and he's been, he or she's been on the ranch now for 10 years and nothing has really changed that, that, that becomes, that starts to feel like somebody's being used or taken for granted. And the whole idea of delayed compensation is if you have agreed to work at what is lower than what Lindsay said is the industry standard or a competitive rate for your area, what are the reasons that you've agreed to that? And can you write with your employer, your father, or your mother, or whoever the employer is, or the person writing the checks, Can you write with them a letter of understanding and have everybody sign it? Because sometimes people will accept a lower um, merit-based pay, I'll call it, based on their skills, because they have a bigger vision. Or as you said, Shay, the cash flow is hard. And with cattle, you know, I wish the season we're in right now, 23, 24, with better cattle prices. Everybody wishes we could stay here forever and even get higher, but we all know that cattle prices are cyclical 
And a lot of cattle ranchers that I've worked with, unfortunately, have not really done well since 20, 2003. And we know what happened that year when BSE changed the world, right? So there's just so many different factors that compound around and what people feel is, is fair. And so I really want people to think about a letter of understanding if they agree to a lower wage than the, what they actually feel they're worth. And then in that letter of understanding, and at this date, this amount will be compensated for by this event. And so some people in transition will say, well, I'll sell you that pasture land for fair family price whether, rather than fair market value. And the difference between my price and fair market value will be um, compensated according to what you delayed, right? And so there, there's that piece. And the other thing I want to say is a lot of people will stay in a ranch where the culture is healthy. So it's not just about money. It's also how do you treat your people? Is there respect? Is there lack of conflict and high tension and drama? Is the opportunity for you to bring 10 of your own cows into the mix? And there's another fight about compensation because a lot of non-farming family ranch kids, they have cows on ranches that they never see. They just have cows there. And I go, well, who's paying for those cows? Oh, it's a, we just put them all together. Well, they're, they're, then that becomes a different form of compensation. Someone's growing your cows and you're not paying for it. Does that seem fair? It's uh, There's a lot of complexity with all of that or can be. So I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, we've talked about what compensation is. We've talked about how to determine worth and why compensation is so important, but who should be compensated? Should it be a per person? Should it be per family unit? How can you navigate that? Because Maybe it's a husband and wife. Maybe it's just a wife. Maybe it's just a husband. Maybe it's a husband, wife, and the kids and grandpa and grandma. You know, there can be multiple laborers within one family unit or, but then like you said, maybe the brother or sister is not married, has no kids. So how do you determine who gets compensated for their work on the operation? Well, I, my my bottom theme on that, Shay, is there should always be, in whatever work anyone does, <clears throat> excuse me, a fair exchange of value. And so <clears throat> what is that fair exchange of value? Is it money? For some people, it is money. It's having, it's being paid. But I have a ranch family right now in a lovely state with mountains in it, where uh, she is, her fair exchange of value is just to be able to live on the ranch. And she's, but she's aging, but that's her fair exchange of value. So there's also a conversation about what is a fair exchange of value look like to you personally as to how you're being compensated. And it has to be a to you. Each person needs to speak about what is workable for them and what is not. And the other thing is that if you're in a corporation or working in a partnership like two brothers, which is very common, the two brothers also need to be in alignment as the stakeholders, as the main directors of the corp or the ranch, that they agree with the decisions that they've made around compensation, because that's going to cause a lot of niggling tension and pinch points, we call them, over time. If one brother says, ah, oh, sure, he can have that, no problem, I don't need that, and the other brother's going, whoa, 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 I sat down and did this compensation worksheet thing that Elaine sent me, and it was very revealing. They also used it with their non-family employees. Because it also helps the employees who are non-family understand the entire value package of what they're getting by living, working, and breathing on said ranch. So I, my, my thing, Shay, is always be clear. Being clear is kind, like Brene Brown says, and be clear with every individual and don't make assumptions about what people think is a fair exchange of value. And Lindsay's shaking her head, so now she could talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about this clarity point is really important. I think a lot of times uh, we we get a little bit fearful around sharing compensation or information that has anything to do with money. And so these honest and open conversations explaining what the full compensation packages are. And, and again, like Elaine said, what is that fair exchange of value? 
Um, people might ask for something that you weren't expecting. So sometimes the starting point can just be, what does FAIR look like for you? What ideas do you have? Um, and it's no different than leadership where you have to treat everybody differently. Everybody involved in this situation is gonna have different wants and needs. And you might have one person with a family and maybe the family doesn't really work on the farm at all. And then you can have a discussion about whether there's any compensation involvement there, right? It, often that would be a no. But maybe in some cases, there's other, other there's other um, you know historical practices that would change that. So I think you start with an open conversation, and people should be paid if they're contributing to the operation, and we can figure out to what degree, you know, in each situation. Thank you for diving into that. Um, so with all of this, there is a lot of mindset barriers in the ag space around money and business and compensation that need to be worked on or broken. And Elaine, I really like what you said about money as a form of energy, because that's something I really believe in and really work on an abundance mindset and not a scarcity mindset and money. And that makes a difference, but that's probably a whole nother conversation. But the one mindset barrier that I really want to bring up is how do we start shifting and breaking that mindset that every penny the farm earns goes back into the farm? Because that's what a lot of people are operating or that's a mindset I hear. How do we start breaking that? So first I want to respond to that question about money as a form of energy and, and every penny going back into the business or the ranch. My first words out of my mouth is, where is that written? Is that in the unwritten rule book of this ranch family? Is that because that's the way grandma and grandpa always said it had to be done? And Susan Forward wrote a book called Emotional Blackmail, and she uses a phraseology, phraseology, where is it written? So this is the problem I see, Shay, in all of agriculture. The mindset that I'm working so hard to shift in my workshops is on the left-hand side, you put all the assets of the ranch the cattle, the fences, the hay equipment, the barns, the houses, whatever the ranch owns goes on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, you put your personal wealth bubble. And that's the liquidity side that you could get. And if you had $2 million on that side, which would be lovely, a 4% return on $2 million would give you 80 grand a year, which would be an amazing amount of money to live at a decent, modest level as a family. But also if you had liquidity from other assets, like in the States, it would be your Roth accounts or your, your 401ks or whatever, anything or cottage property or a house in town, whatever that looks like, that is liquidity for you to divest of those properties or those assets to use cash and however you want to use that cash. And if you, if you keep putting everything into the ranch at the expense of the personal wealth bubble side, you actually handcuff yourself. And I don't think people understand that. And the other thing is there also tends to be, well, you have to scrimp and save and put every penny into the ranch that you make for the ranch. No, because, you know, there's a saying, if you have two pence, spend one on bread and the other on hyacinth, which is a flower, which means you have to have some pleasure in your life and some fun and some freedom to enjoy the family circle. And I think you and I say before, I, you know, bring up my little circles because you have the family dynamic and you need liquidity in your personal finances to take care of yourself and self-care, but also to take care of your family for fun things beyond the business, but also possibly for daily living or for critical illness insurance or long-term healthcare insurance or contingency plans. And then you have the actual ranch management. And those decisions should be made collaboratively, personally, and business-wise. And Dick Whitman will tell you, if you're talking about what the ranch is spending on uh, compensation, you should also be talking about your personal, your family side wealth as business partners, because you need to understand that some people's lifestyles are a little bit out of line with what their expectation is for a draw from the ranch. And so it you can see when you look at these three singles circles or, or links, the family, the manage, the ownership of the ranch and the management, 
those are like three separate decision-making systems. But what happens if you don't pull something to the personal side, then it's always going to be mucked up and commingled in the ranch. And the ranch becomes a monster because the ranch is never satisfied. And that's the whole mindset that has to be blown up because you have to be able to protect money and save money and spend money within the family circle as well as the ranch circle. And you're going to have different value systems between different families on that ranch. And that is why it's so prickly when the brother who's a single brother, and I know these people, spends no money because there's nothing to spend on it. He's a workaholic. It all goes back on the ranch. But what about his other brother, who's a really good manager, makes higher level decisions, happens to have a spouse and a few kids? Total disconnect. So the mindset in agriculture that needs to stop is that the ranch has to consume everything. And I'm my question is, why aren't you going to ranching for profit and finding out how to make your ranch more profitable? Absolutely. Ranch should be making money. <laughs> yeah, the, the ranch should be making. And just like anything, I mean, if someone asked you, um, you know, would you would you start a business and work all day and night forever? to make to make no money at all and you'd say no I'd probably make a different choice right but we find ourselves sometimes in these situations because we take out as little as possible and then we restrict our personal lives but then we're trying to keep the ranch growing and um at the at this self-sacrifice and then what kind of life is that you rack up your personal debts or you're always a little worried or all these kinds of things that make life not as enjoyable as it can be so this mentality that Elaine talked about where we just have to scrimp and save and all the sweat and blood and tears goes into the ranch and we'll be fine because we're doing it for the ranch. Like, yes, but we'll function better if we have a healthy personal side and that will just flow through all the channels, including the product productivity of the ranch. All right. Well, ladies, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I have gotten so much out of it. I am have no doubts that every listener will get more than one thing or just tons of information in here. I'll pack together, but to be respectful of everyone's time and your time, uh, we're going to wrap things up right now, but before we hop off, where can people find each of you, whether that's a website or an email you want to share and that I can also include in the show notes. We're at farmfamilycoach.com. We also have a podcast, farmfamilyharmonypodcast.com. And people can reach out for a free 15-minute discovery call. Shay, if I really tick them off today. <laughs> like something I've said, that's fine. Because having a conversation is the best way to create solutions and find harmony through understanding. And that's what we're all about. So just reach out and we're happy to share tools like the compensation worksheet, I've also got one of Dick's job descriptions, 6.2, he calls it. And I'm sure Lindsay has more tools as well. So we don't want people to suffer in silence. Silence needs to do the heavy lifting and conversations around these interesting issues like what we've talked about today, but you are not alone. And as, as hard as things may be for you right now, you have options to create solutions. You can express your feelings. You can reach out and you can adapt. And all of those things are positive conflict behavior that we want to help you have the tools to do your life better on your ranch and to have the life you've always wanted. Excellent. Um, so you can reach me. Um, my email uh, is lindsay at curbridge.ch. Um, I'll get you to put that in the notes for spelling. And then curbridgeco.com is the website. Uh, we also do free consultations. They can be up to an hour because we can get into some of the, the business details. But um, compensation projects and organizing compensation structures are very common projects for us. And um, if anyone in the farming and ranch world is interested in support with that type of thing, send an email or or find us on the website. All, All right. right. Thing, Shay, just want to say thank you to how we've done this podcast today. This is the new reality of how agriculture works. Lindsay and I only live 40 minutes from each other, but we've never met each other in real life yet <laughs> because Not we yet. got Zoom together. And, and, and so I just want to encourage listeners that even if you live in Montana or Sheridan, Wyoming, or, you know, Dunseeth, North Dakota, it doesn't matter where you live. You can have access to really good ag advisors to help you move forward. 
absolutely. We are definitely in a great era of having access to resources. So thank you so much to both of you for joining the show today. Thank you, Shay. Always nice to talk to you. Have a great season. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.